As Parliament opened in May 84, only Robert Muldoon knew just how bad the economy was and how difficult it would be to write a budget. Positive economic changes had been made under Muldoon, but even they had been made despite him. Even the acclaimed closer economic relationship with Australia. Thank you. He, he was a very, very reluctant starter with CR. Hugh Templeton drove the whole thing from Watergo. And I expected Muldoon to sack me. And for the first two years, I was never sure he would support it. And it got so bad that when Sir Wood became president, all the ministers uh, were invited, one at a time, to come to the National Executive and put their proposals on the table. Because in the National Executive, he only had one vote. So George Gare got transport deregulation through, Jim Bolger got voluntary unionism through, and that was the mechanism that was used. She was the wild but even this back doorway of getting round the Prime Minister was now no longer working. The man who was never wrong would just not listen as a sick economy began turning into a crisis. It was becoming difficult for us to borrow, difficult for us to offshore, difficult for us to potentially to repay our debts. I mean, it was a real dilemma. I think he, he knew and he, he never made this public even within the party how serious things were. The truth is that he couldn't do a budget, wasn't going to do a budget. When he was being Minister of Finance as well as Prime Minister, it was a pretty well closed box. And nobody could get inside that box. It was all secret stuff. We'll never know whether a now stressed and desperate Muldoon could have written a 1984 budget because on June 14, he drunkenly announced to a startled country there would be a snap election. Have so we got a date, Prime Minister? Uh, we got a date the 14th of July, which we've worked out at Government House as being the appropriate date. That doesn't give you much time to run up to an election, Prime Minister. Doesn't give my opponents much time to run up to an election, does it? The move also stunned his own party because, as ever, he was acting alone. The bizarre events of that day began in the afternoon when Muldoon called party president Sue Wood about rebel national backbencher Marilyn Waring, who was threatening to defect. My response was, do you want me to talk to her? Because um, from time to time he did ask me to mediate and that was my initial response and he said no i'm simply informing you as president that was it sensing something was up sue wood arranged with barry lay for a private talk with marilyn and chief whip don mckinnon's sue office and she flew to wellington I picked her up from the airport drove in to see mckinnon hadn't been in mckinnon's office 30 seconds Muldoon came in pissed as a fiddler's cat and we thought, oh no, what the hell? And we knew it was set up. I immediately said, I've come to see Marilyn. And took Marilyn away next door into the junior whip's office. Marilyn and I talked for probably about half an hour. And uh, she gave me her assurance that she would not bring the government down. She did not want to vote against the government. And it was only the nuclear issue on which she would take that stance. And I said, are you prepared to tell the Prime Minister that? And she said, yes, I am. We went back into Don McKinnon's office and the Prime Minister was still there. And then we got into this slangy mice and went on for hours and hours and hours. Absolutely disgraceful. Worst, worst scene I've ever been in. Unbelievable. Yeah, there was pretty much of a shouting match between he and Marilyn over, you know, do you realise what you could do? You could bring down the government sort of thing. And she was crying a lot. He knew what her position was. Her position had been spelled out many, many months before. There was, uh, there was absolutely no uh, way that he didn't understand her position. But again, when, when, when he'd been drinking and he became vicious, uh, he got very nasty, very ugly. And she said, I give you my word that I will not vote against the government on any issue other than the nuclear issue. And um, I want you to know that, Prime Minister. And he said, you're a liar. And I said, Prime Minister, I want you to speak to me as president. I accept Marilyn's word. And so as president of the National Party, I'm telling you that Marilyn will not bring the government down. He wouldn't accept that. But he wasn't prepared to be put into that position. And I can, I can agree with him on that. Uh, many people have spoken about the necessity for a snap election. And there was a, you know, a very unpleasant exchange. 
and he wheeled around to Don McKinnon and said, have you got the list? And I said, what list? And it was the list of the members in marginal seats who had all assured him in the course of that afternoon that were he to call a snap election, they would all win their seats. I knew nothing about this. That certainly wasn't my view. In fact, the day before, we'd had an executive meeting all day at which we'd analysed the key marginal seats, and they weren't looking in very good shape. So it was obvious all the work had been done. He and Don McKinnon left and called, and he said to Don, call the caucus. And moments later, party president Sue Wood, who has only just heard about the snap election, stands stunned in the TV lights as her drunken leader lies about her involvement. That's right. How much warning did you have that this was coming up, uh, Miss Wood? She stayed very close all the way through. Well, obviously, I keep in close touch of the leader. How long ago did you anticipate there would be an early election? It was only this afternoon. Yeah. But we've been talking about this as an option for quite a long time. Uh, Whether it was deliberate or a drunken blunder, Robert Muldoon signed his political death warrant that June evening. There should be no nuclear weapons inside our sovereign territory. The myth is that Marilyn Waring brought the government down. In truth, she was a scapegoat for her Prime Minister, who cynically used her in an all-or-nothing bid to hold power. He would control even his political ruin. That's it! Marilyn provided the excuse for him to say it's over. I, I just think he miscalculated. And I don't think he realised how badly he'd miscalculated until he was several days into the election. Muldoon had called the election to re-establish control, but as the campaign progressed, events rapidly began to spiral out of his grasp. And once the campaign was launched, you see, he never had any time, he never focused on the election at all. Every minute there were new messages coming into his office from the uh, um, Reserve Bank Governor, Spencer Russell, and, you know, and it was all bad news. The run on foreign exchange began the day after Muldoon announced the election, but he refused to even see officials who knew we had to devalue. I was astonished by that. He uh, declined to see the Treasury uh, as well. And uh, after several requests through his secretary, uh, we then got some papers sent back to us late on Sunday night, and uh, the papers had some written comments on them, uh, which declined uh, the recommendations to devalue and agreed instead uh, for the Reserve Bank to uh, take the brunt of the foreign exchange crisis in the port exchange market, which of course subsequently turned out to be enormously expensive. And I don't believe that the people of New Zealand... So while the Prime Minister crisscrossed the country electioneering, he was secretly trying to suppress crisis. He was now so desperate to keep control, he would risk financial collapse in a desperate bid to save his own skin. But there was no way in which you, you could have talked them into an exchange adjustment during the only two days before an election. And that was, you know, it was obviously political suicide. <laughs>